Uh, next up, we have Spencer uh, from CockroachDB. How many of you have heard of CockroachDB? Nice. It's a pretty good crowd. Um, so last year, we actually had Andy on our uh, Rocks Meetup talk about like generic architecture and design choices and, and, and what is um, CockroachDB trying to do. Um, and now Spencer will talk a little bit about how they are using RocksDB to achieve their consistency model. Let me, yeah, uh, generic MVCC. Uh, there you go. Yeah, reverse this talk a little. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. So. Um, Thank you for the introduction, happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how we actually implement our MVCC model. So uh, most of you did raise your hands, which is great to see. Um, in terms of having heard about CockroachDB, I'd say most audiences, it's probably less than 10% that I'm presenting to right now, but uh, you guys are an advanced crowd. But for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, I'll just give you a brief overview of it. It's a SQL database. Um, but it's a SQL database that is intended to be um, all of the rest of these um, things. So it's scalable, survivable, and consistent. Scalable, horizontally scalable, you wanna be able to put in commodity hardware and get you know, a, a commensurate amount of capacity um, out of it. And you also want the apps to be agnostic as to how that works, it should be transparent. Um, survivability, we wanna have um, not just survivability in terms of losing a disk or losing a machine, but actually losing an entire data center. and, and you know, cheap, um, very importantly, when that does happen, we want to uh, have no artifacts from the failover. Um, and, and the way that we do that is we're strongly consistent. Um, that's a bit dialable, but um, by default, it is strongly consistent. We're using Raft to mediate the replication. Um, and, you know, this, this is, um, you know, very much inspired by Google's Spanner project um, and with F1 on top of it, the SQL thing. So I should mention that SQL, is uh, actually decomposed uh, when a, we, we parse a SQL uh, command that comes in into an abstract um, syntax tree. And then that actually gets decomposed into a set of key value commands, um, mostly scans and conditional puts. Um, and you know that actually gets put into what the sort of foundational um, layer that uh, Cockroach implements, which is a distributed um, key value store. And that key value store implements transactions and uh, it, has a, uh, an MVCC model. So, you know, what is MVCC? Most of you people in this room for sure are quite aware of what it is. Um, it's multi-version concurrency control. Um, you know, basically what that means is that you don't overwrite a value when you write a key twice. Um, instead what you do in, 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 in the case of Cockroach is you actually attach a timestamp as part of the key. So think of it as a composite key between the key and the timestamp. So, um, you know, this really is the basis for our transaction model in Cockroach, and that's and that's that was the the driving motivator for having our own MVCC model. It allows us to implement snapshot isolation, which um, you know f I think Oracle still calls serializable in the ANSI SQL standard. Um, we also implement serializable snapshot isolation, which um, prevents some of the anomalies that are allowed by snapshot isolation. So, one great thing about MVCC and having you know, timestamp marked versions of um, the various values you've written for a single key is it allows long running queries. So this could be things like uh, you know, a very large SQL query um, that you know, is being done for the purposes of data analytics or business intelligence, anything like that. Um, also you know, running a MapReduce that might take four hours over like, you know, terabytes of data. All of these things can be done um, as the data continues to evolve you know, sort of at the, at the current timestamp. So it also um, enables some pretty interesting use cases. Um, for example, asset price databases. You know, uh, typically something will be written at market close for a particular price, and there's adjustments that come in afterwards. Um, getting historical, repeatable reports for regulatory purposes or receipts from last Christmas, even though the price has changed many times in a database for a particular item, and um, it 
allows, also allows you to roll back a table to a, a, a particular point in time. So in, in Postgres, some of you may be familiar with um, time travel. It's just a, a mechanism where you can specify a timestamp you'd like to run SQL at. So we support the same sorts of things. So you may be asking yourself if you know a lot about RocksDB, you know, like how many turtles are there down in terms of MVCC levels? Well, you know, uh, and RocksDB, of course, does have its own, and that's how they implement their snapshot feature. Um, but uh, the RocksDB, MVCC, and what we needed from our MVCC, um, you know, parted uh, fairly dramatically. We originally considered, you know, possibly modifying and forking RocksDB. We got a little ways into that, and we decided that would be a terrible idea, so we decided to build a layer on top of it and have a separation of concerns. So digging down a, a little bit into it, um, you know, there's there's how we store the key, this composite key. So what we do is we actually encode the key first. It's an escaped encoding. Um, really what that does is just make sure that we can have a terminator suffix that will never occur within the encoded key. Um, it's a very straightforward encoding. And then that allows us to put a timestamp in the end, at the end of it. And the timestamp that we actually have for cockroach because it's a distributed system. There's a there's a sort of a wall time part of the timestamp, and then there's a logical part of the timestamp. So uh, there's eight bytes for the Unix nanos and four bytes for the logical, and uh, you know these are stored most most significant byte first, and they're actually um, uh, stored in a decreasing order. So if you have a you know in this case we have two keys, and each key has two different versions. Um, you know, what we have is the encoded key with no timestamp, and we have this MVCC metadata that's stored up there. So the MVCC metadata um, in, in Cockroach, we actually store things like whether there's a provisional write intent. This is an uncommitted um, bit of transactional write. Um, there, there'll be a pointer to the transaction record that uh, caused that. There's also things like uh, deletion tombstones. Um, we keep the most recent timestamp. There's some sort of accounting information in there. Um, and there's also a, a, a possibility of inlining the data itself um, in certain cases. So underneath there is where we actually store these, you know, versioned keys. So in, in this case for uh, key A, we have uh, something at time three and something at time one. It's just a simplification, of course. And you know, you have the corresponding values that were written at each of those timestamps. So if we want to step through like an MVCC get in Cockroach, we're actually using um, a, a pretty cool feature of RocksDB, uh, which is a prefix iterator. So what we actually, what this allows you to do is rely on bloom filters um, when, you're, when you're doing seeks within you know, a, a set of keys that have a certain prefix. And this works out very nicely in this model that we have because we do have a, a prefix. The, the prefix for you know, the MVCC metadata and all of the versions for A are, is going to be the same. So if we actually want to find B at timestamp 1.5, what we do first is we search for B to take a look at its MVCC metadata. So that kind of that takes us down um, to this level, and then we may look in there and find that there's some transactional issues that might be ongoing, or um, you know, there's there, there's a couple different reasons we do it. But then uh, the next thing that we're going to do, and this actually, of course, is using the Bloom filters. So you know, it's quite possible that you know we if there's many many Bloom or SS tables, for example, that might have to be searched as part of um, this seek. Uh, we may actually just have to go to one if we're lucky, or you know, uh, several if the if the versions. If there's a lot of versions, you may actually um, you lose some of the the benefit of the bloom filters. But we've actually seen that they increase things by almost a factor of three x in you know with a, a, a relatively small but still sizable number of versions. So that that takes you um, to the MVCC metadata. We inspect it, and then we do another seek. And typically, this is all completely cached by the iterator. So that's it's actually quite fast. But then we we'll seek to the timestamp that is less than or equal to what we're looking for. So that's going to take us here, and then we read the value out. So it's a bit different for a scan. With the scan, unfortunately, we can't use the bloom filters because. Um, for example, for scanning between A and C, we really don't know what could possibly be in there. We don't know whether you know A is the first one or it's A zero zero or A A B. We have no idea, so the bloom filters don't work for us. So we have to use a total order iterator. So works very much in the same way. However, uh, if we're going to search for A, um, we're going to look for the we're going to seek to the encoded value of A, which takes us there, um, and you know examine the MVCC metadata, and then we're we're searching at time t equals 2. So we're going to search for the first timestamp that's uh, less than or equal to t time t equals 2, which takes us here. We're going to read that. And then what we do is we actually increase the seek to be the next possible key after a. 
So in this case, it's A with a, a zero byte after it. So that, that takes us to B, of course. So we do the exact same thing. We examine the MVCC metadata, and then we move on to the first timestamp that's greater than or equal to two, which takes us there. And then we do the same thing. We, we seek for the next possible key after B, which is what we're on right now. And that takes us, in this case, you know, either to the end of our iteration, uh, if there's more data, let's say you know, D is the first one or C is the first one, or the iterator will become invalid. So you know, that was just sort of the MVCC stuff. I wanted to include a little bit more for anyone that's using RocksDB for Go, uh, from Go. So as uh, you may or may not know, Go actually um, integrates with C via something called CGO, and this is kind of like JNI and Java. Um, it's a very fast, low overhead interface. Um, but you know, you're using C directly. And uh, RocksDB has a nice C API, and we originally started using that, and uh, we're reminded of what it's like to program in C, <laughs> which uh, we decided we preferred C++. And uh, so we, we, we figured out a, a pretty decent way, at least so far for us, um, to use C++ even though we're doing this from Go. And the way that we do it is we've actually defined our own custom C API. Turns out we're using a, a pretty small subset of what RocksDB is offering um, in terms of its a much more complex and fully featured API. So those, uh, you know, the, the surface area that we're using, we define our own um, fairly simple C functions, and we do it inside an extern C block, which basically uh, keeps the compiler from mangling those um, method names so that they can be accessed from Go. And then, you know, within there, we're actually, um, that's really, it's a fairly simple, small, compact um, .h file. And then within, in, in, the, in the .cc file, we actually implement those, those fairly simple functions, which then call into um, the C++ code. So um, we've actually found that having our own custom API was really, really useful from Go. In particular, we were able to reduce um, a lot of copies and allocations and dramatically improve uh, the system's performance, especially when iterating over many values. Um, if you use the uh, RocksDB C API directly from Go, you end up copying strings a lot. And so if you, you know, iterating over terabytes of data, you're, you end up doing a huge amount of additional copying and allocations. Of strings. So finally, Go get is really cool. This is one of the, I think, cooler things about Go, trying to make it a more modern language. Um, it essentially lets you, to, lets you um, not worry about downloading packages and dependencies and things that you need when you're trying to run a Go project. Um, when we initially started with Cockroach and we needed to use RocksDB, we had to build our own make file. That was just part of the project. So this kind of, someone wanted to use Cockroach in turn from their Go project, they couldn't just use Go get. They'd have a, a real dependency problem there. So we, uh, and th there are other things that we've ended up using as well, not just RocksDB. Uh, and there's also RocksDB's dependencies, which we had to deal with. Um, Protobuf is one that we needed. And um, so what we ended up doing is forking RocksDB and forking all of these other projects. And the only change that we make in there is we add a, a cgo flags.go file. What this is is a bunch of sort of commented out Go, um, it's, it's, it's commented out compiler directives um, in Go. And, and essentially, if your platform is a relatively modern Unix, it works just great. So, you know, Linux and uh, Mac OS work fine. And those are the ones that we support. I'm sure some of the other Unixes would work um, fairly well as well. Uh, Windows will not work, however. But um, the really great thing about it is that. Um, you can import RocksDB directly into a Go pro, uh, program, and um, Go, the whole Go sort of tool chain knows what to do and is able to download RocksDB, compile it appropriately. And also, you know, we, we need C Snappy, and we have CLZ4, and C Protobuf. All these things are downloaded um, from these projects that we have uh, within the CockroachDB repo. So um, I, I think there's already some other people that are using uh, not just RocksDB, but uh, C Snappy and some of the other ones. So feel free to use those. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Um, the question is whether we use the merge iterator from Go. And we actually do. We, we decided that since we're a scale-out database, we didn't want to rely on something like OpenTSDB or InfluxDB to store time series data, for example. 
and we wanted to support rollups and other things. And uh, we actually do use the merge operator um, on our time series data. And we were using it for something else. I think that use case may have been removed, but we, we do use it. It's not part of the what I'd call the core key value store, but we do we do use it for time series information. Great, no more questions. Thanks, guys.